Okay. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our forum, How Not to Go Viral. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bill Hammond. I'm the Senior Fellow for Health Policy at the Empire Center. Um, today, we're going to be talking about an, uh, what I think is an underappreciated part of the healthcare system, um, the public healthcare system. This is the part of the healthcare system that um, focuses on um, populations instead of individual patients. Um, we have an amazing panel of um, experts. They, each of them, I've noticed, has both uh, a math, an MD and a Master of Public Health degree. And between the three of them, they have 77 years of front, you know, hands-on experience, real-world experience of the public health system, specifically in New York. Um, at the state and local level. Uh, going in alphabetical order, we have um, Guthrie Burkhead. He's a professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Albany. Um, he had 27 years in the state health department, rising in positions of rising responsibility, ending as deputy commissioner for public health programs from 2007 to 2015. Um, and he's also a graduate of the CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service. This is something I've been reading about. Um, maybe other panelists are in that too. Um, Anil Vaidian um, is the commissioner of the Dutchess County Department of Behavioral and Community Health. He has 25 years of experience in the public health world. He oversees a budget of $64 million and 200 employees. Um, and he previously worked had uh, worked in the uh, health departments at Rockland and Westchester counties. And finally, Isaac Weissfuse, a medical epidemiologist, 25 years of experience at the local and national levels. And for much of his career, he was deputy commissioner of health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where he was in charge of infectious diseases, emergency preparedness and response. Um, and he was involved in the response to the 9-11 attack and an anthrax attack and the 2009 influenza pandemic. And he's on the faculty at Cornell University Public Health. So I would like to start by reviewing the timeline of the early part, the first 13 weeks of this pandemic as it approached New York. Uh, so, this is a timeline I put together. It's, it's not perfect. It's mostly focused on New York, but it has um, events around the world. So the, the world came to know about the existence of the, this novel coronavirus on December 31, courtesy of an, an email put out by the ProMed, the ProMed service. Um, a few days later, the BBC picked up on that and did a story about the mystery virus in Wuhan. So that's week one. Uh, I have to get rid of this here. Uh, in the second week, um, the CDC took notice, issued an advisory about this virus. Um, there wasn't much to say at that point. And at the end of the, of the second week, China reported its first death and posted the genetic sequence of the virus on the internet for the world to see. Um, in week three, and this is kind of an interesting thing. I, I don't know if it was known at the time, but Moderna designed its vaccine only a couple days after that genetic, genetic sequence was, was posted. Uh, and also, uh, you know, both CDC and the New York State Health Department being aware of the virus and started putting out advisories. The first case was reported in the US in the state of Washington in week four. Um, a couple of days later, China closed Wuhan. Um, it, the a first case popped up in Illinois the next day. And this, this is when I started paying attention when I saw the, the video of the construction of the emergency hospital and the, uh, the bulldozers traveling in circles, it was crazy. And then there was a case in California that, that to close out week four. In week five, um, I'm including South Korea here because I think they had such a, a successful response. 
they met with, they had a meeting between government officials and their major uh, companies that produce medical tests on the 27th. A few days later, the World Health Organization declared an emergency. Uh, the US declared an emergency right after that. And then kind of fatefully, the first cases were diagnosed in Italy. And that was the same day that the President Trump tr uh, restricted travel from China. Um, and at the end of the week, the, the emergency hospital was finished. On February 4th, week six, both the US and South Korea gave regulatory approval to their diagnostic tests on the same day. Um, and the next day, uh, it, the, the virus turned up in Wisconsin. It was, it, was, it was turning up all over the country, including areas that don't see a lot of tourism. Um, the testing was so limited, I believe it was limited primarily to people who had been in China. So it, th these tests were probably um, travelers, but it was popping up all over the country. Uh, on February 6th, Commissioner Zucker warned providers in New York to that there will be shortages of uh, personal protective equipment. On the 7th, um, testing starts across South Korea in 46 labs. And on the 8th, another fateful moment, um, US labs started reporting a problem with the CDC test. They were getting positive results when they knew the negative, the sample was negative or vice versa. I'm not actually sure. Um, the next week, CDC called a halt to testing by most labs. Um, the first case was detected in Texas. Then uh, the next week, it turned up in Nebraska. And at the end of week eight, Italy recorded its first deaths. Um, a couple days later, Italy started locking places down. Meanwhile, in New Orleans, the Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras kicked off. Um, and now things start getting crazy. In, on the first day of March, we had the first case in New York as well as Florida and Rhode Island. The uh, legislature gave the governor emergency powers. He held his first briefing that Monday. Um, we had cases popping up in a bunch of additional states. Um, so it seems to be it's pretty well ubiquitous at this point. Um, uh, week 11, Italy, it, this, things are getting really bad in Italy. Um, you're seeing news coverage about overcrowded hospitals uh, and the entire country is under quarantine by March 9th. On March 10th, um, Governor Cuomo uh, imposes special restrictions on New Rochelle. It's being perceived as the first community outbreak in New York. A bunch of new states are reporting cases. The governor bans gatherings over 500 and the NBA suspends games on March 12th. New York records its first death on March 14th. The governor follows by closing schools. Um, and this is when the mayor proposes a shelter in place order. Um, Tom Hanks and his wife announced that they have the virus. The Navy ship deploys to New York Harbor. Then the governor announces New York pause on Friday, but it's effective on Sunday. It takes effect on Sunday. And I've looked at data from IHME. They've done a lot of analysis. And their estimate is that New York's infections peaked on March 23rd, one day after the pause took effect. And I think that, I mean, that's sort of why I made Mark this week, the last week of this timeline, because that was the beginning of the end of New York's pandemic, at least in terms of infections. Um, it didn't feel that way. We obviously had a lot of um, suffering to, to, to look forward to at that point, um, but it was, it was in retrospect, it was when um, the, the infection rate uh, started to slow, and we were on our way to um, the other side of the hill. Um, and it was also that week that the um, health department issued its uh, controversial advisory to uh, nursing homes, and the Javits Center opened. So uh, I thought I would start by asking each of our panelists 
Um, and I guess I'll go in alphabetical order again. Um, excuse me. What, what point in that timeline did you first get a sinking feeling in your stomach, Dr. Burkhead? If you well, thanks. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I think I was paying attention to this from the very first press reports in January. Um, this was eerily familiar, uh, reminiscent of the 2003 SARS outbreak, which with a similar virus starting in China uh, and spreading uh, rapidly that we, we may talk later in the program about that outbreak that was ultimately controlled through public health measures before it really reached a, a true pandemic phase. But I was, I was really focusing back then on the potential. And I remember I was beginning to teach a course at the School of Public Health on HIV and wanted to make the point that HIV at one point was an, an emerging infection also. And I showed the headline from the New York Times from early January about this new mystery virus and said, this, this is what we do in public health. We, we are on the lookout for these new emerging viruses and we need to pay attention to them. So I think the ta your timeline is great. And it, I think throughout that there was a rising level of concern. The other touch point for me, which you didn't list was in late February when uh, CDC official, uh, Dr. Nancy Messonnier on a conference call said that she had talked to her family uh, about the, the coming restrictions and the, the difficult times ahead. And uh, I, I know Dr. Messonnier and I know she was serious when she said that. So that, that was really sort of the icing on the cake at that point. Dr. Wydian? You're uh, muted. I think when you know uh, we heard that uh, coronavirus was circulating and and causing illness and death in, in in China, I think everyone's attention within the public health realm uh, was peaked and and we were listening. I think, but for me, uh, what what made it real and I, I was absolutely sure that it would reach our shores soon is when I saw cases in in Europe. Uh, and shortly after, uh, you know, uh, the ban on travel from China, I felt that again, uh, Pandora's box was open, and you know, locking down China would uh, optically would would look fine. But again, uh, it was only a matter of time before uh, uh, the U.S. would see cases. Dr. Weissmuse. I was following it, um, but I think my personal panic button went off at the end of January when it became really evident that there were tens of thousands of cases in Wuhan. Um, and, you know, because we realized in New York City that we could get any infection within 24 to 48 hours, that meant that it was probably in New York City at that point. I agree with Gus that uh, one turning point for me was also Dr. Messonnier's um, a conference, a press conference. You know, CDC is a very responsible organization and um, they try not to, um, you know, alarm people unnecessarily uh, as a, you know, as this is a going way of communication. And they try to sort of foreshadow, th you know, things that are coming up. But when I heard uh, the highlights of that press conference, I realized that what she was saying is that we are, you know, facing down a really deadly pandemic, um, and I and I think that just sort of uh, sped up my thinking about how severe this was going to be. And that again, that was at the end of January. Uh, I don't, Gus. Do you remember when the? I think it was around uh, February twenty fourth, something like okay, that. Okay, late February. Yeah. You, you said something before, Doctor Weiss, that caught my ear. Did, did you say New York, New York City? is liable to have uh, a positive person within 24 to 48 hours. Is that sort of from anywhere in the world? Is that a rule of thumb you have? Yeah, that was really um, sort of the going assumption at the city health department that if there was a problem anywhere in the world, it would be on our doorstep and it could be you know, fairly soon. I realized that you know, 24 to 48 hours makes it sound uh, um, you know, really rapid, but in you know, there have been cases where we, where we identified problems in New York City within a day or two 
of something going on in the world. So um, that was our sort of our rule of thumb. Yes, yeah, you ever look at, a, at the, those maps they have of airline routes, a lot of them lead to, a lot of them lead to uh, New York. Um, so one thing that I've been interested to know is we have, I know we have pandemic plans and I imagine they have them in New York City. They have them, certainly have them in the state. Maybe they have them in every county. And I guess what I'm wondering is how useful were those? Were they well written and were they followed? Um, why don't we go do it backwards this time, Dr. Weissfuss? You know, the, I, I would like to say that the plans were well written because I was uh, overseeing it in New York City. So I will say it was well written. Um, I think we have to understand that plans are not uh, blueprints for how you react necessarily in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, that every uh, situation involves careful thought and analysis. And, uh, you know, you can't necessarily be a slave to the plan if the data or the information is showing you uh, something that may not really uh, coordinate with the plan. So for example, um, this was, uh, you know, clearly had a very high uh, degree of death rates associated with it, although it wasn't clear in the beginning. And so um, you sort of take away parts of the plan that dealt with mild influenza epidemics or pandemics. So, you know, I think a plan is good, but one shouldn't be, um, you know, committed to following the plan uh, you know, word by word, uh, unless, you know, unless there's a careful thought about how this new infection, which nobody had ever seen, really falls into that plan. Dr. Bidian? You're, I think you're ready to go. Um, uh, I, I think it's important uh, to understand that, uh, you know, Pandemics plans, you know, looking at surveillance, testing, countermeasures. I, I think on multiple levels, whether it's federal, whether it's state or local level, uh, we do have a framework, and it, it it doesn't necessarily have to be very specific. Uh, but what's important is on. I could speak from a local level that you know it, it's critical with regard to the coordination from federal to state to the local level in terms of how those plans are executed. And, and I will tell you, while we had a plan uh, on the local level, we were waiting for guidance on things like testing, things like masks, uh, especially at the local level, uh, testing was a critical issue. So it, it, again, I would, I, I, I would support that Plans are, are, are sort of some guideposts, but they don't necessarily have to be adhered to because again, that they're, the plans leave a lot of room for tuning, fine tuning, depending on what the pathogen is and what the realities are on the ground. Dr. Burkhead? I would agree with both both speakers. I think people think, we oh, we have a pandemic plan. It has highly detailed instructions on what to do at each point, but really it's impossible to have a plan that is considers every contingency and every decision point. So the plan is, as both speakers have said, is, is a general approach. Actually, the planning process itself is probably as important as the plan, which then ends up sitting on the shelf. It's the relationships and the consideration of the team that is gonna respond is part of the planning process that's really important. And so when, an, when a pandemic occurs, immediately the plan is, is out of date and you need to be adjusting, but hopefully within the parameters and the considerations that the plan gives you. And I agree with Dr. Vidian that the, you know, our plan at New York State or, or Dutchess County's plan or the city health department's plan is really contingent on functioning as part of a, the broader you know, national plan uh, and uh, and at the local level, the state's plan. So it's these plans are inter interlaced, interrelated uh, together. So I, I think our all of our plans had the right considerations, and you know the planning. Hopefully, the planning process prepared the the people in those positions to then begin to approach the you know respond to the pandemic uh, in the right ways. One. 
Yeah, I don't think people should think that the plan had a, had a, is a specific menu or a cookbook about what to do at each step of the way, because that's not, you can't really plan in that way. There was a moment um, in late March when the governor was kind of scrambling to add capacity for hospitals. And one approach that he took to that was identifying uh, facilities that could be converted into hospitals. And he, Javits was one, but there were several others. There was a, a nursing home that had just been renovated and hadn't been opened yet. There, uh, I think they took some SUNY dorms. And I guess one thing that I was wondering at the time is, did they not have a list of facilities like that in a file drawer somewhere ready to be pulled out in an emergency? Or did they have to generate that list in real time? Do you know, I mean, is that something that would have been part of the planning process? Doctor, I guess I'm focusing that on Dr. Burkhead. Yes, I think that there were a part of the planning process was to this notion of how do we expand the healthcare system and, and create new places. So we did back in the 2000s after 9-11, which when a lot of this planning really kicked off, uh, um, look at available facilities. I think probably the Javits Center was on, listed on a plan or in each community, um, particularly when we get to talking about vaccination, uh, they're, they're, they identify large venues where you can move a lot of people through safely. So yes, yeah, part of it's part of the thinking, but but you know, t over time, you that's the sort of thing you would need to renew and update because knowing that a nursing home was going to be renovated but not yet active would not be something that would necessarily be in the plan sitting on the shelf. Uh, so you, you do have to in the event itself, have to take another look uh, at, at what your options are to, to expand healthcare. So, uh, yeah, Dr. Weiss, Yeah, somewhere in um, the 2000s, uh, CDC, in the CDC uh, cooperative agreements with states, uh, they required or they asked for the identification of facilities that could provide quarantine. Um, and uh, in New York City, that was really hard to find. Uh, we had a couple of ideas, but it, none of it panned through. Um, and our conclusion was that at the time, we would have to unfortunately have to rely on, you know, gubernatorial powers to be able to access uh, hotels or other places that might serve as uh, venues for having people, uh, you know, in isolation or quarantine. And I'm willing to put my neck out and say that most states had problems and most localities had problems finding adequate quarantine facilities uh, during that time period at least. So I think it was probably somewhat of a nationwide problem until the event started. So uh, Dr. Vidian, you mentioned the crucial, the, 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 the position you were in of waiting for guidance and also waiting for testing from CDC. And they had that really just fateful stumble with their testing technology. And I don't know if we really understand what, how that happened, um, but how, how much differently would things have unfolded if that test had worked? Uh, and I, and I, it kind of raises a broader question in my mind is, what is kind of the optimal testing strategy? The, I've looked back at the advisories that were going out, and I think this is partly driven by how rare the, the tests were, but it was extremely limited. You weren't supposed to test anybody unless they both were symptomatic to a, a severe degree and had a recent history of travel to China. So you were, you were basically ruling out the possibility of detecting community spread. Um, and I get, I, Given the limited number of tests, I, I understand why that was. But what would be your the ideal situation with testing, and and how much difference would that have made um, if it had been available in say early February? I'm not sure I'm the uh, the right person to answer this. I, I could I could uh, give you my experience on on the local level. Uh, uh, and, and you addressed it, which is the fact that, again, to, to have some idea of 
the scope and and the impact on, of of a circulating virus on on uh, a community uh, dictates that you have a, a good and robust surveillance system or the availability of testing. And earlier on, uh, you know, there was a disconnect. Uh, you know, on on one side, you know people were saying that testing was available, but again, our experience was that, again, we limited testing to those that were symptomatic and those that met a specific criteria. If our question was, you know, uh, how much has the virus penetrated into the community, we would have a lot more open and robust mechanism of testing individuals. You know, especially viral pathogens that present in a very protean way and can present like flu-like illnesses, you know, those individuals who come in, you know, obviously one of the, 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 the things on the differential should have been COVID and they all should have been tested. So again, part of, of, of our experience on the local level is that again, Earlier on, we had some degree of restrictions in terms of who could be tested. And uh, I will tell you that from the identification of our first case to 100 cases identified was in a, is a matter of weeks. And so to me, that was, was sort of like, uh, uh, the, the records were shouting that again, the, 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 the problem was a lot worse than we knew it was and what testing was indicating. And so I was quite sure that again, it was circulating the community in, in a much more significant way than we gave it uh, uh, any thought. Was that, you, you were having that feeling before we went to the uh, New York on pause? I think there was a general understanding that it was circulating the community that again, uh, you know, the, the, you know, probably, you know, the, you know, testing availability was far outstripped. Did, uh, did either of the other panelists want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I think I think when this is all over, the, the failure of testing, not just the initial CDC stumble, but the failure to really ramp up testing quickly will be one of the one of the real findings uh, and one of the things that we need to figure out how to correct next time. Um, yeah, this, my understanding is that the CDC sent out the samples that they prepared for the control samples, supposedly negative samples were prepared in the same lab as the positive control samples. Uh, and there was cross-contamination, which with a, we're talking about a PCR test to measure genetic material of the virus are very extremely sensitive tests. So mm -hmm. any little contamination and that was recognized very quickly when they sent it out to the state laboratories. Um, <clears throat> but it, it took really a month to, for them to figure out, just go ahead and you know, use the, 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 the controls that we know are good. Um, and uh, so it, it, uh, there was a delay, an additional delay following initial stumble. But I think actually the whole, the whole plan about, <clears throat> you know, this, we've repeated this through, the first SARS epidemic and Zika virus and other things, CDC produces a test, gives it to state health departments. They are, have some capacity some, and large city health departments like New York City, those labs have some capacity, but their capacity is gonna be limited also. And so we really need a mechanism to, to gear up and engage as we finally have done the academic and commercial and hospital laboratories to do this testing much more quickly. And you asked if that would have made a difference. I think in February, it would have made a difference. We would have seen that, that the suspicion about community spread was, was actually happening. Uh, and we were only really seeing the tip of the iceberg. And I, I think we might have moved more rapidly to uh, shutting, things, shutting things down, which was the ultimate control measure that uh, you know, met with success with, after the inevitable delay it takes for a control measure to have impact. But I, th I think it starts with the testing. And so next time we, need, we do need to have a much better plan. And that includes uh, you know, the supply chain for the supplies that laboratories need, including the chemicals and also the swabs and other things. I think it was clear that the federal, at the federal level they were struggling or, or not not didn't really have a plan for how that was all going to 
going to work. So that 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 really needs to be worked out so that we can scale up more quickly. The state and and large city labs are good as a start, but they're not going to be able to to meet the demand uh, that that we eventually saw here. So we need a, a plan to scale up even beyond that. So sorry, that was a complicated answer, but I think lab testing is one of the areas where we really do need to have a better approach next time. I mean, there was. I mean, I, I, I read coverage of how, of how it unfolded in South Korea. And one of the very first steps they took was convening that meeting. It was held at a train station in Seoul um, of the testing companies. Uh, so they, they were enlisting uh, resources and they also, I guess they were building in redundancy because you had more than one company was working on it at the same time. Um, uh, so in the absence of testing, what are the other tools that the public health world has to look for signs of community spread? And, and in that context, I want to share my screen again. Um, this is a, a chart of flu-like illnesses reported in New York City emergency rooms. And the flu season was kind of tailing off in February of 2020. And then right at the end of February, right here, there was a surge. And I've constructed this chart so that it looks really dramatic, but there was a, a, a surge in flu-like illnesses being reported in emergency rooms. And then this is a similar data set statewide. The state data is based on a percent of ER visits rather than individual cases. And I've got it here lined up against previous years. And you can see that the curve in early March was an outlier compared to previous years. And I, I guess I have a couple questions here. I'm guessing that the people like you in those departments were looking at those numbers that, and, and how quickly do they come in and, and were, were those charts that I just showed, is it just 2020 hindsight that they showed a problem or would it have been evident to the, to the people who were looking at them at the time? Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Weissfuse, if you don't mind. Well, you know, one indicator, uh, you know, beyond syndromic surveillance was what was happening in northern Italy and in Wuhan. Uh, so, you know, you could see that and get reports on it. And so that was, I think, a really, um, you know, important factor in deciding what to do. But, you know, syndromic surveillance uh, dates back to the early 2000s in New York City. It was actually uh, pretty much created by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene following 9-11. Um, and they have years worth of data. And basically the data shows that every uh, flu season, there's a big spike in flu-like illnesses, flu, people with flu-like illness going to emergency departments, and then it calms down. With the exception of April, 2009, when there was a big spike because of H1N1. But the idea was if we had a big spike at any other time of year, this was a serious, serious problem. And I, so the data is looked at every day um, when I was in the health department, every day at 10 o'clock, I got a report on the syndromic surveillance for the prior 24 hours that looked at, you know, all sorts of things, uh, but certainly trends. And I'm sure, uh, you know, the only response to, to the data that you just showed is to jump up and down and scream uh, <laughs> is really uh, the proper response as far as I'm concerned. And I have no doubt that in the city health department, that's what was actually happening. Now, I'm exaggerating, obviously, there are other things to do. But my point is that um, when you see that, and the, you know, they had been sort of looking at it for 15 years, that data, um, that's a really, really critical, uh, you know, turning point. Well, as you say, they had other indicators. I mean, you were already on high alert because of Wuhan. You had... Um, you had the example of what was going on in Italy. You know, as you say, you're assuming that problems elsewhere in the world get to the New York in a hurry. And then you see what happened with the syndromic surveillance. Um, did, were you, can I ask uh, Dr. 
uh, Vidian, were you seeing anything like that? Do you, I don't suppose you have syndromic surveillance in Duchess, or do you? We do have syndromic surveillance, okay. and, and, and actually we've also adapted it for uh, uh, opioid deaths. Uh, and so we uh, did not, we did not have uh, enough numbers to sort of uh, mirror what we see with New York City. But nonetheless, you know, the, the, the information that we've received, as Dr. Weiss, you said, around the world with what's going on in Wuhan and as in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, you know, made us realize that, again, it's, you know, our experience is, is somewhat going to mirror what we're seeing uh, overseas. And, and as I mentioned before, from our first to our hundredth and from a hundred to our first thousand, you know, it was going in a very exponential fashion. And, and so, uh, you know, it, the timeline was becoming very compressed. And so while I can say that our local syndromic surveillance added much, you know, nonetheless for a city like New York City, uh, you know, it, 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 it may not have a resolution to tell you, oh, this is the pathogen. But it, again, when you see triggers, it really sends off alarm bells. So uh, if, I could, if I could just add one, one quick point on the state, state level data. So syndromic surveillance is a statewide system um, gathering data from all hospitals in the state. But if you look at the curve you showed of the New York State, data, it, it, uh, it hides the fact that that was not uniform across the state. The spike actually was occurring uh, in the state data uh, on Long Island and in the lower Hudson area. And we, didn't, we don't report the New York City data, but that, so this spike was happening in the New York City metro area, not, not statewide at the time. So Dr. Vidian might not have seen much happening at that point uh, in Dutchess County, a little bit upstate. Um, so the, the syndromic surveillance though is, is extremely useful. And uh, as the state data showed by the first week of March, it was showing an inflection point and, and heading back up from the flu season decline that I'm sure people were looking at and were very concerned about. So I could, this, this, this kind of takes me to the next question I have, which is at some point, if you're the scientist and you're looking at the data and you know, you're combining that with your knowledge and experience and what's going on in the rest of the world and you become alarmed, what is the avenue for communicating that to the, to the people who are in a position to, to take the dramatic steps? Um, how often does it come up that you need to do that kind of a communication? And, and are there routine meetings or is it something where you have to reach out and ask for a meeting? How, how does that work? Uh, I'll, starting with you, Dr. Burkett. I think at this point in time, all of the, the state, the city health department, the county health departments had engaged their incident management systems and were meeting probably daily, if not twice daily uh, for situation updates and identification of issues. So. I would expect that these data would came up in those daily meetings that involve would involve the incident commanders within the health department and with summaries provided up up to the higher to the higher level. So I, I think I think that you didn't need to set up an extra meeting to to present this. This this should as as with all the other situational awareness data that are generated should be being considered by the group. Uh, on a daily or twice daily basis. So high ranking officials in the state would have presumably would have been aware of, of what that number, those numbers were showing. Okay. Um, Dr. Weissfuse, um, there was an incident, I believe it was in mid-March where an official in the, the New York City Health Department um, threatened to resign. In fact, he had he kind of gone outside the chain of command from what I understand. He'd gone to the city council, the, the council speaker, and he threatened to resign unless, and I don't know what his specific ask was. I think it might've been to close the schools or to do some, some dramatic kind of social, uh, a, a reaction in terms of social distancing. And, and um, is that something like, 
that seems like an extraordinary step to take and, and a, a sign of amazing level of frustration. Um, how, it, is that unusual for, for, for there to be such a, um, a disconnect between the health department and, and the political operation, the mayor's office? Not, not political, but like the, you know, the, the top echelons of city government. Yeah, I think it's unusual that um, he sought to uh, talk to the city council. That's that really is out of the chain of command and uh, um, wouldn't be something that would be uh, well looked upon nor and during normal times. Let's put it that way. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I think it is amazing. Uh, but I, you know, I think on the other side of that, I mean, he was frustrated about sort of lack of action on behalf of the city of New York. And so his judgment was that was the best way to deal with it. Um, you know, wish it hadn't come to that because then, you know, it would have made it that the city was taking more proactive steps uh, to deal with the situation. But I'm sure it wasn't viewed favorably from the perspective of chain of command and uh, sort of the unofficial traditions and uh, behavioral guidelines, if, you, if, the, if there's such a thing in terms of city service. I mean, it was a couple of days later that the mayor first floated the idea of a stay at home, a shelter in place or whatever the term was. Um, th this, another question I have, and this, um, I remember hearing people throw around terms like shelter in place, stay at home. Um, and I have to say, I had never encountered that concept in my life that I remember. And it must have been quite a thing for a governor or a mayor to hear that the, the thing they have to think about is basically shutting down the economy, um, certainly dramatically reducing all activity, um, closing Broadway, closing schools, closing most businesses other than essential businesses. Is that, I mean, is it as unprecedented as it felt like to me? Or is this something that is in the tool book of epidemiologists and it's been implemented in other situations around the world and it's just new to us? So I'll, I'll start with uh, Dr. Burkhead. Yeah, I, th I think it is something that's in the tool book of uh, public health. Uh, and it dates back actually 100 years to the 2018, 2019 influenza pandemic where many cities in the United States <clears throat> took measures like this uh, for shorter periods of time, uh, but closed, closed schools, uh, uh, closed in some cases businesses, many cities did, did it differently. There wasn't a coordinated approach back then, but uh, we, we call these non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, in other words, we're not giving a drug or a vaccine, but we're taking other steps to prevent spread of infection. And so it very much is in, the playbook, in fact, during normal influenza seasons, occasionally you'll see a school district that will close because of high absenteeism. That's perhaps not as much a public health measure as just realistically they, they're having trouble mounting their educational efforts because so many people are out sick. But, it, but it, there is that sort of precedent to point to as well. But as part of the pandemic planning, very definitely uh, the idea of, of uh, shelter in place. Shelter in place actually sort of comes from the hurricane world where the decision is, do you evacuate or do you try to, to stay put when the storm hits? Uh, but it, it's similar, similar concept here. But it's, it's definitely what one of the scenarios that's played out in, in every pandemic plan and in every drill of pandemic plans that happens. Well, what, was it ever used before this in your career, in your histories? and any of your histories as a, as a public health official. Dr. Weisses? Yeah, I mean, uh, Dr. Burke had referred to it, but in, in many ways, 2003, the SARS uh, outbreak was a dress rehearsal for what we're going through today. And, uh, you know, the city of Toronto did an amazing job in, in setting up quarantine uh, and shelter in place. And so they were able to really successfully do it and, you know, really uh, stands out as a model for how to deal with these issues. But uh, again, that was sort of the dress rehearsal in some ways for what we're going through now. So I, I, think, I, think, well, I think we should say that obviously this pandemic is unprecedented in the last century in, in, in public health. It's something we in public health talk about, re try to remember uh, from, from 100 years ago and, and 
are concerned about, but uh, we, there's nothing on this scale has happened uh, uh, in, in the last hundred years. Um, so, uh, I mean, we, we haven't brought up, Dr. Dr. Vidin um, did mention that, that um, at the local level, and I guess at the, also at the city and state level, there was a sense of suspense waiting for guidance from CDC. Um, can, can you talk about the division of labor between, and division of authority between CDC and state and local authorities? And, and whether is, in light of what's happened, does that need to be rethought? Um, do you wanna try that one, Dr. Burkhead? Sure. So in the United States, we have a federal system. The states have a lot of primacy, uh, particularly in the area of health, which is not actually, the word is not actually used in the constitution. Um, so the states have the primary authority through public health laws at each state level to have required disease reporting, authorize quarantine, uh, take, other, take other measures, close down, you know, close the economy, close schools. Those are generally state responsibilities. The federal government has some limited quarantine responsibilities at the international borders uh, and the quarantine stations at international airports, but the federal government's primary roles are with the CDC to be the scientific experts, uh, the public health experts, uh, and also funders. So most, most of the funding that comes to state and locals for public health preparedness comes through CDC uh, grants uh, to the states. But CDC is really the, the scientific uh, and, the, and, the, and the public health experts in the country that we we look to for coordination, for guidance, uh, uh, <clears throat> and for and for funding. So I think, yeah, the, the the this is another issue. I think that this pandemic has brought to light that under certain circumstances, you know, CDC was not as effective and was and was countering conflicting messages from higher up in the administration at that time, which is it was really a recipe for disaster. I think in this case, so. Uh, Dr. Vidian, the um, in the aftermath. Well, ma actually, maybe this this is better for Dr. Weissfuse. In the aftermath of 9/11, um, the New York City Police Department um, instituted. It was actually, I think, it was in the aftermath of the 1993 World Trade Center attack. The NYP decided NYPD decided to build up its own counterterrorism operation. And it even had personnel placed in, in foreign cities so that they could directly uh, investigate and respond to terrorist incidents with the thought being that the same thing could happen in New York City and they wanted to be ready. Is there, is there room for a similar strategy, uh, both for either for New York State or New York City uh, when it comes to pandemic response, not necessarily having people on the ground in other countries, but to think more uh, independently of the of the CDC and the WHO. Well, first of all, I mean, you know, prior to this, and I think others would agree. I mean, the relationship between states and cities and CDC was was uniformly very good. Um, it wasn't perfect. Nothing is ever perfect, but. Um, in 2009, you know, the um, communications were open. There were lots of, you know, meetings and briefings um, between states and cities and, and CDC and states. Um, and so I think that, you know, we, we got used to having, you know, a good relationship. Um, that being said, New York City was never shy in expressing its uh, opinions to CDC. Um, and so I'm sure there was uh, a lot of back and forth. Um, I think what we need to do is repair that relationship to the degree it's been compromised, uh, rather than, you know, having uh, New York City, uh, you know, it's okay to disagree and, and things, you know, happen in different areas at different times. And so there may be different, uh, uh, you know, sort of preventive measures put in. Um, but, you know, I think the relationship with CDC, I think most cities and states would like to go back to where it was, where it was a pretty... Uh, open to dialogue and, and briefings and communication. Dr. Vardian? 
I would echo what Dr. Weiss uh, just said. Uh, it's important that, again, when we look back and, and, and you know, uh, dissect, you know, how uh, we responded to this pandemic, what we will see is that, you know, the 50 states, you know, all behaved somewhat independently uh, in terms of, of the, their response. And what we'd like to see on the local level is that we are in lockstep with our neighbors across the river, for me, across the river and nearby, in terms of the guidance that we, we uh, provide, in terms of, of the actions that we take. And all that is predicated on, on the science that, uh, that the federal government, the CDC and the NIH has reviewed and 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 uh, and 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 sent down uh, through the states to us, uh, and so again, I, I welcome that relationship, and 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 I would echo that it, it, prior to this uh, pandemic and 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 previously, you know, I, I I always felt as a local health department that we were very well supported by the state and the CDC as it came to things like. H1N1 and other uh, uh, incidences. So I thought it would be good towards the end of the first hour to see if there were questions from the audience. Uh, I guess. We do have a question. Oh, here we go. Um, Okay, now this is interesting. This is kind of, there's a fact in this question that has not been previously introduced into evidence. Uh, when the discussion been between New York City and New York about shelter in place and pause was going on, the communications between New York City and uh, state DOH were briefly cut. What happened and which health department initiated the cut? Does anybody on this panel have any information about that? Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, there's a question about vaccines, which I, I want to get to in the second half of the program. We insisted on rigorous tests and treatment groups versus placebo for interventions that seem logical. Uh, were there rigorous control tests of mandatory lockdowns versus non-mandated individual judgment? Um, I, think, I think what this question is getting to is, is there a, a rigorous scientific evaluation of lockdowns? Because um, you did see a lot of voluntary restriction of social distancing. I think it's been documented that visits to restaurants plunged even before there were any government actions taken. Just people became wary of, of going out to public places and, and the audiences for, for uh, mass events declined. The NBA voluntarily closed down its games. Um, it, is, is there any way to test um, the, the policy of mandatory lockdowns versus voluntary behavior, uh, and is it necessary? Does anybody want to read? I think the closest thing that we have to scientific evidence in that regard is uh, people have looked back at the at the flu pandemic in 20, in 1919, 1918, 1919, and, and what some very interesting work actually done looking at what was reported in the press about different cities, what steps they took to limit and when they took those steps. And then you can look at the death, the death data uh, you know, by day, how many, how many excess deaths occurred. And there is some evidence that those cities which took more rigorous uh, efforts to, to lock down, if you will, and it, it varied across the map uh, what, what they tried, but that there is some evidence that those measures did, did reduce the, the excess death toll in those areas. And that's part of the reason why that strategy, I think, remains on the, on the, on the list of things to, to consider. Um, so it's obviously not possible to do a randomized trial. Um, I think all you can do is observe, do observational studies of, and we can do it, we can do it now. I think it's, there's some been effort to do that during this pandemic as well. Look at 
particularly the time frame of when steps were taken, when were schools closed, then what was the subsequent pattern of cases in those communities. So it, it's suggestive, I think, that measures like school closure and other things do, do uh, have an impact uh, in reducing subsequent cases. I mean, speaking for myself, this isn't any kind of rigorous analysis, and it's it's obviously just one anecdote. But when I when I saw the juxtaposition of when New York on pause started and when New York's infection rate peaked, based on kind of a uh, extrapolating backwards from I think it's largely extrapolating backwards from when the death rate peaked, it was almost exactly the same moment. Um, you know, the, the, the Monday when those, the Sunday or Monday when the, when the lockdown took effect is when the infection rate started to decline. Um, could be a coincidence, <laughs> but it seems like it's a, it's a remarkable coincidence if that's the case. I think, I think you have to realize that when you take a measure, it, it's not, it probably is not going to immediately have an impact. It, you have to wait for an incubation period, at least before you would see the case count start to drop because previously infected people would still be getting sick at the previous rate. So I, I'm not sure I have seen the data you're talking about, uh, but the, that's the, you'd have to do some kind of analysis that took into account the lag from exposure to infection, the lag from infection to diagnosis, the, the lag from diagnosis to hospitalization and the lag from hospitalization to death. So the death rate often lags three weeks or more behind uh, you know, the cases. Uh, so that, that, that's the kind of analysis that you really have to do to, to try and tease out whether a specific action had a particular impact uh, on cases. So I had- I'm sure there's gonna be an examination of uh, municipalities and, and different states as it comes to other mitigation steps such as, uh, uh, you know, mask wearing and, and what impact it had on case rates. So, you know, the data, you know, from what we've learned during this pandemic, the data and, and the analysis and the literature will follow. So I had intended to take a break at this moment. Um, yeah, so uh, just a few minutes. So um, I'd ask everybody if, if they want to visit the restroom or visit the kitchen. Um, uh, and we'll we'll reorganize in a few minutes. Thank you. Five five minutes. Why don't we say thank you? People can hear me. I think we'd like to get started again. Excellent. So um, I thought yesterday um, I participated in the legislature's hearing on the health budget. And, you know, the public health budget is included in that, but I have to say it didn't get a whole lot of attention. I brought it up. The New York State Association of County Health Officials brought it up. But the, 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 the conversation as usually is was completely dominated by uh, Medicaid primarily and and the the financial needs of the medical providers of the world. Um, I mean, I in my own research, I found pretty striking evidence that the the budget for public health at the state level has taken um, pretty substantial hits. Um, to give an example, the the Wadsworth Labs, in terms of what's reported in the in the state budget its budget had shrunk by 40% over the past 10 years. Uh, and its state funded staff had plunged 67% from 620 to 200 full-time equivalents. Now, I think there may be, that may be a misleading because there's a, a segment of the staff that's uh, you know, on the payroll of something called the Health Research Incorporated. But I, I, I guess I wanna get from each of you, what has been your experience of resources, the trend in resources for your various agencies uh, and during the course of your career and, and um, 
so I'll, I'll start with uh, Dr. Vidian. So uh, I, I, could, I could tell you that uh, in, in my last two decades of, of public health work or, or training, uh, what I've consistently seen across the, the, the locales I've been is a, a consistent uh, reduction in public health staffing. Uh, and, and so it, it's interesting. It, it's not just, you know, you know, individuals we mix around, but there, there, there are individuals who have worked in public health in particular areas who have uh, uh, expertise that is lost. And I think one of the things that we do very poorly, you know, and I speak for many institutions is in terms of succession planning and actually having a mechanism of transferring some of those skill set to the new generation. And so I, I will tell you that, you know, I, again, I, I, I may be speaking out of turn, but I, I will speak for my colleagues uh, within New York, across the board, uh, our health departments are doing more with less. So there are more mandates that are placed on us in terms of, of I, I could just speak for uh, communicable diseases, uh, uh, but again, we're, we're trying to manage and, and meet those mandates with less staffing. Dr. Weissfuse, has that also has that also been the case uh, in New York City? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, New York City finances are a bit of a roller coaster, um, in the sense that you know Wall Street or or um, real estate have better years or worse years, and that can affect uh, tax receipts, and that can affect hiring at uh, you know city agencies. So, for example. There were many times during my tenure when they were hiring freezes for up to six months where you couldn't hire anyone because they wanted to you know, save some money. Um, in emergency preparedness and response, it's really focused, the, the uh, money really comes from the CDC. And starting, I would say, with the financial uh, collapse in 2008, 2009, those funds nationwide have gone down. And at the same time, CDC has actually asked for more so the state and local health departments are always in this very uncomfortable position of trying to figure out how to do all the things they're asked, but yet have a lower budget seemingly every year. So it was a continual juggling and, and uh, you know, difficult issue to manage. Dr. Burkhead, you were, you were at the state health department during part of the 10-year the period I just described. Um, was what did did Wadsworth and, and other public health functions did they really shrink to that extent or or is there something I'm missing? Well, I think I think you're right. There has been a reduction in the number of state staff uh, <clears throat> in Wadsworth over over time. You mentioned HRI. That's a, another funding mechanism, but th that's primarily grant driven. So those staff are working on specific grant funded projects. So that doesn't necessarily provide. You know, cap the capability, base base capability that you would need. So that that is correct. I mean, you're you're highlighting here something I think that's been also driven home by this pandemic is that our whole public health system is is underfunded. Uh, the 2008 uh, economic downturn was a severe blow. Uh, some, by some estimates, 50,000 public health work jobs were lost during that time, and they really haven't they haven't been rebuilt. So I think the hope is that the pandemic and the rebuilding from that will finally, people will finally see the benefits of public health and it will be put on a more, a more stable funding basic uh, basis. Isaac is right that the, the, the preparedness funding primarily from CDC has shrunk more than 50% since 2011, since 2001, excuse me, when it, it really started. And, um, and that, you know, the, the other phenomenon there is that it's cyclical when you get smallpox or SARS or Zika virus, there's a, a punch, bunch of funding comes through and then it, then it goes away. So you're sort of always on a ro this roller coaster ride, uh, trying to build capacity and not lose, as Dr. Viding said, not lose the expertise of the staff that you've hired and trained uh, because their, their particular funding stream disappears. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that the need for 
certainly the need for pandemic response is not a consistent thing, right? It, you know, we went for a hundred years without, without uh, uh, an event at this level. Um, how do you, like, it, is there a, a logical strategy for, for having the resources you need for a major event and then going for years in between without a major event. How, I, I'm not sure how to how, how how government can handle something like that. Well, for one one thing, I think you need you know you need core public health workers, and and most people I think working in public health have changed jobs during this pandemic to work on the pandemic. So okay. you can, obviously can't have a fully trained pandemic workforce sitting in the wings, but you need to have a strong capability. In your existing public health workforce, and you, but you take them that. off of say smoking prevention and move them over. Well, I to think, and I think that's what's happened logically. But you do need a core of of uh, preparedness staff who, you know, update the plans and do the you know do the drills with the county, the counties, and the city, and with CDC, and uh, maintain the expertise to to operate the the incident command system that you need during a during a pandemic. So those are all things that you you need to to fund and keep active. So um, another concept that was unfamiliar to, uh, to many of us, myself included, is contact tracing. Um, it became a big focus of the state uh, and of a lot of, a lot of, I mean, the whole country and probably the world were, were thinking about it at one point. And a whole bunch of money was poured into it and a lot of people were hired. Uh, I went in in preparing for this event. I um, Dr. Vidian brought this up, and I, I wanted to get his perspective on how contact tracing is best used and when it becomes less effective. Sure, I th I, I think uh, you know contact tracing. Any public health department has this within their armamentariums of tools. And it is a day-to-day -day function. And you know, one of the things that public uh, health laws mandate that we do is to uh, do surveillance, uh, investigate, and control uh, communicable diseases. And contact tracers uh, within our department are trained particularly to do this and do this on a daily basis. Uh, what the pandemic highlighted is the fact that, you know, you know, the way that contact tracers or disease investigators have been trained is they're very good to deal with uh, uh, issues or, or pathogens that are of low incidence. So, you know, I, you know our, I have absolute trust in my contact tracers if it's a case of primary syphilis or, or uh, you know, Legionella or whatever, that again, a very thorough uh, investigation is done, and all the, the 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 issues and individuals that are that are that are part of that cluster per se is is identified, and and we install uh, control measures fairly quickly. But when you know four of our contact tracers or disease investigators dealt with you know initially a couple of cases, and within weeks hundreds of cases it sort of overwhelmed our capacity to be effective. And this is where I, I you know, I, I feel that, you know, technology and other uh, IT platforms would have been really helpful. We've known from HIV that individuals who know their status uh, change behaviors. And so if we, earlier on, I thought if we had the access to a platform where, you know, we had a positive and we pushed out through text or other email uh, notification of their positive status, link them to uh, education and, you know, the commissioner's order, as well as other links in terms of making sure they knew what was expected in terms of isolation and quarantine. And, and, and I, I think we would have been able to meet you know, some of the demands of, of the, the, this pandemic, especially with regard to scale. Now that we have hundreds of contact tracers who are on the state system and also locally, and we also are, are using IT, we're doing a much better job, but this is sort of well, uh, one year into 
this whole process. So yes, uh, you know, contact tracing has been challenging to say the least. Does it do you do you get to a point of diminishing returns? In other words, if 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 the infection is really widespread, how much difference can it make if you identify the source of exposure around a particular person? Does I don't know if, if any of the other panelists want to weigh in. I'd say a certain point, um, you know you need to add on the non-pharmaceutical interventions of you know, quarantine on a general population base because uh, you may not be able to contact trace your way out of the, you know, the spread of disease. So I think at that point, you need to bring in other interventions to you know, buttress support for contact tracing. The, um... One issue that came up very early in the pandemic uh, was infection control and, and, and pe uh, personal protective equipment and, and other standards around that. Like um, there were reports of healthcare workers being asked to work when they'd been exposed, when they were symptomatic even in some cases. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering is, was there, in my work, I see these report cards that are done on hospitals and nursing homes. And some of them put a particular focus on nosocomial infections and the ability of health, healthcare institutions to prevent people from getting sick within the institution. And those indicators often will raise a, uh, concerns about the status of infection control across the country. And I have to say, sometimes in New York in particular, that that, that gets flagged. And I'm wondering if, it, is that something that we should put more focus on coming out of this pandemic is our sort of baseline level of infection control so that when there's a disease out there that we don't even know about, we're, we're sort of taking precautions against it all the time. Dr. Burkhead? Well, I, I think there has been a lot of effort in the public health community in dealing, trying to deal with the, the issue of nosocomial or, or healthcare acquired infections at the state level. We have a system of reporting hospital infections. Uh, CDC has a pretty well-developed program as, as well and a data system that a lot of states tag on to. This is focusing on, on uh, you know, surgical infections, uh, of uh, urinary infections, infections related to uh, often bacterial or, or fungal infections in hospitalized patients. So a lot of emphasis has been put on that. Um, this may be a little different uh, <clears throat> in that, uh, uh, you know, as you indicated, uh, uh, personal protective equipment and training on that and the availability of such equipment is, is really important uh, for you know, controlling transmission of, of COVID in, in hospitals and, and in nursing homes. And that there's certainly been a gap there and just the availability of the equipment and also the, the training that goes along with it. So it, it is related to the, to the broader issue of, of preventing nosocomial infections and you know, hospitals and nursing homes need to have staff that are de devoted to uh, monitoring infections in their facility and training training staff and other things and that's been a gap in the in the nursing home area particularly um, um, so yes it's you're highlighting a, an important issue um, and, and particularly I think in this pandemic the availability of, of PPE has it may, may continue to st still be a, a problem uh, and one that uh, we need to figure out how to fix do you I mean does anybody know? how our practices in the US compare to other developed countries. I've seen some people, some commenters say, you know, they, they, they pull a picture of a typical ER or a typical operating room in another country and the, the, everybody's swathed in, you know, their heads are covered and maybe they're wearing a respirator and like they're, they're just, they're more armored against infection. Whereas in the picture in the typical U.S. hospital is, you know, maybe 
a paper mask or you know what I mean I, I I guess I don't know how how to measure that do you have do you have is there information like that about the sort of the normal standards of infection control and how it compares you're talking about normal standards or during the during the pandemic I mean I think during the pandemic what I've seen is, is you know the care of patients in the hospital everybody is in in full PPE garb uh, uh, so I, I think our infection control standards are pretty are pretty high we know we know what how to do it we need the equipment and we need the, the training and we need the monitoring and quality control but I, I don't think I don't think we're and I, I you know I don't know comparisons with other countries but I, I think we we do a pretty good job of that when those conditions are met okay um, I guess we should talk about, I mean, I, I had primarily focused on the early stages of the pandemic, but I think um, the vaccine rollout is, is kind of on a lot of people's minds right now. Um, and this is an area where, uh, as I understand it, there was a great deal of preparation put in at the local level. Uh, and then that the, those local plans were not actually implemented in, in the moment. So I, I wanna start with Dr. Vidian on this one. Um, how, how much planning was done and what did that look like? And would it, have, would it have worked in this situation given the issues with supply, the, the issues with refrigeration and, and uh, the, the hierarchy of who qualifies and who doesn't qualify? Was, was the county plan well adapted to that? So, you know, I, I will speak uh, for uh, Duchess, but I, I will tell you that local health departments around the state uh, uh, have trained and have built up capacity to run pods or points of, of dispensing, whether it's vaccines or other countermeasures uh, for quite some time. And, and so I, I think that skill set and that capability is built into to many of the, if not all the, the health departments uh, within the state. Um, so we were unsure of, of what the vaccine distribution plan was, but nonetheless, we are at the local level were uh, preparing, you know, we had access to our own refrigerators, uh, the deep uh, cold refrigeration, we, we spoke to some of our research facilities and, and made uh, MOUs to make sure that in case it was, the, if it was the Pfizer platform that we had the capability of storing it appropriately. Uh, but ultimately, you know, uh, we were prepared uh, to receive vaccine and distribute it through a pod or with our partners. And ultimately, the issues with vaccine distribution, I think, all had to do with issues of supply and demand, and and you know the the demand far outstripping the, the current supply. And so, uh, while on the local level we were prepared, a lot of it was predicated on federal and state plans on how the rollout would would look like. Has has the county's system? Uh, what what you intended to do use for mass vaccination has it been fully engaged, or or is it one of many systems that's operating in Dutchess County? So I think there's a realization uh, across all of, of of local public health that again the the health department. Uh, you know, d doesn't have the capacity to, to vaccinate everyone within their particular county or municipality. And so part of the plan is leveraging uh, the, the infrastructure that's already built. Why build something new when it's already existent? We have large uh, health systems, uh, hospitals, as well as provider groups that see hundreds of thousands of patients every year. And they provide hundreds of thousands of vaccines every year. And so I, I think we were under the, the assumption that while the local health department would be responsible for running pods and focusing our efforts on vulnerable populations or, or populations that may not have access or the ability to to it may not have a provider. Uh, so we were under the presumption that, again, these large groups and, uh, and uh, existing healthcare infrastructure would have access to the vaccine and would vaccinate their population. 
Dr. Weissfuse, did uh, does New York City have a plan similar to what they have in, in many of the other uh, local areas around the state? Yeah, they have a very uh, well built plan for points of distribution sites. Um, and that's been going on for 15, 20 years. And for many years, we use the influenza season uh, in uh, as a drill to do a mm -hmm. influenza uh, vaccination pod. So we had a lot of experience in doing vaccination pods. I don't think the refrigeration requirements uh, would have been, uh, you know, a problem in New York City. I think, uh, you know, they already have a lot of storage uh, capability, and I think that the Pfizer vaccine requirements could have been met. Uh, but this is uh, something that was practiced basically every year and some and drilled uh, at times as well. We we've touched on this a little bit earlier, but. Um... I'd like to expand a little bit on, there have been scares in the past, new viruses that showed up and looked dangerous, looked like they might become a, you know, a worldwide pandemic the way this one did, but they didn't. And I guess I'm interested if you could give a couple of examples and why, what the difference was? Was it something about the virus or was it something about the response that so with respect to these previous scares that we had? Dr. Burkhead? Yeah, well, so we've mentioned already the 2003 SARS uh, epidemic. Uh, the, so a very eerily similar virus. It's a close cousin to the current SARS-CoV-2 virus that's causing our, our pandemic now. It originated in China, probably jumped from animals to people, uh, originating probably in bats, but through an intermediary species uh, in China. And it, it caused not, not cases on this scale, but the very severe respiratory illness, uh, uh, sort of the origin of the term SARS, severe uh, acute respiratory syndrome, uh, and caused clusters and, and, and outbreaks in Hong Kong and uh, Isaac mentioned uh, in, in Toronto. So it, this, this disease spread around the world by air travel, just as the current pandemic has done. Toronto had, had, I think, several hospitals with major outbreaks, including healthcare workers becoming ill and dying. At, at some points, uh, they had as many as 10,000 people, I think, under, under quarantine in the community and practiced some of the Shut, community shutdown uh, activities that we mentioned. Uh, some, there were some other examples of cities around the world that experienced it as well. Um, and and uh, those uh, efforts were ultimately successful. Now the virus may be different. It may not spread as readily from person to person. Uh, we may have been lucky, uh, but the same kind of public health measures that we're employing now succeeded in, in tamping it down. So that was in effect a, a dry run uh, a few years after that, uh, we in the Middle East, uh, a different coronavirus called Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome or MERS developed again, a very close cousin to SARS and SARS-CoV-2. And that disease also has originated in animals and traveled. Uh, so I think we're getting a, a message here around coronaviruses. This is the third uh, such uh, scare in, in the last uh, you know 17 years, if you will. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, uh, if if the question is leading towards is there a continuing risk of these sorts of things happening after this a pandemic, I would say we'd have to be blind not to see that there there is a risk there. And, and I'll just mention the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic. That was influenza. It it uh, originated uh, in in uh, the Western Hemisphere, spread pretty quickly. New York was one of the epicenters early on in that pandemic as well. Uh, the school system uh, closing down. Um, and it, we essentially dodged a bullet there as well because it turned out not to be clinically more severe than the, the usual flu that we had. But had it been, we could have had a scenario very similar to what we're having now. So in a sense, we, we were lucky. I'm sorry, did you, say, as well. did you say the schools closed down? During that, <coughs> um, in in New Isaac can speak to this more, but there was a, there was an early outbreak uh, in a in a particular school, and, and I believe that school uh, was closed. Okay. Um, I don't think the, the school system. So we didn't the the disease was not severe enough, wasn't overloading the healthcare system 
to the degree that we're seeing it now. So the, the, uh, the non-pharmaceutical interventions of closing uh, you know, schools, businesses, societies, restaurants uh, didn't, didn't happen then. So, so do, I mean, it sounds like you're not absolutely sure about this and maybe it's just not known, but like were those previous, were MERS and SARS, were they like just had a different, um, I don't know what the word for it is, a different profile in terms of their infectivity and their, and their uh, morbidity. Um, was that the difference or was it, we got, you know, there were these quick interventions in terms of non-pharmaceutical, you know, the, a school was closed or a city was closed and that contained it enough that it never broke out. Do, do you have a feel for what the difference was? I, I, others can comment. I think it, it, to me, it's it's most likely differences in the virus and how it's how it's mm -hmm. operating. Uh, it's not the, the SARS original SARS virus may not have people may not have been contagious before they had symptoms uh, may not have been as readily transmissible through an airborne route. Um, I, I I don't I'm not an expert on that, but uh, that's my sense. So this this kind of leads me into a question of why New York? And that's, that's my kind of shorthand way of pointing out that New York City in particular and, and the surrounding areas, including New Jersey, Long Island, um, and the suburbs north of New York, had just, I mean, I struggle sometimes to explain to people how different it was in that area than the rest of the world, rest of the country and the rest of the world. It went from zero to a hundred in, in you know, no time. Um, and there, there have been a lot of sort of folk theories about why that was, you know, we were caught by surprise. Um, we have a lot of tourists, we have a subway, we have dense housing. Do you, uh, I, uh, my own opinion is we don't really know, but I guess I'm interested just to hear from experts what your take is on that. And also like, does this mean it's kind of the end, of, the beginning of the end for New York City? Is it like, is there no future for dense urban environments with lots of crowd-based activities and mass transit? That's, so that's my question. Uh, why don't we start with, because it's New York City, let's start with Dr. Weisfuse. Yeah, I think it's it's probably a combination of factors. Um, I do think that uh, dense housing in certain parts of the city, such as in Queens, where there was a big outbreak and a tremendous death toll in Corona and Elmhurst, uh, was partly responsible. In addition, you had people who, uh, lots of people who can't shelter in place, essentially, because their livelihood is dependent on um, being delivery people or working in restaurants or, or whatever it is. And so they're really kind of frontline people. So when you, you add that, their increased exposure with dense housing, you really get a, a bad recipe. So I think it's probably a combination of many of these things. Um, but, you know, it's uh, something that should worry the city in the future. But uh, I don't think people here are going to give up on New York City. Um, and I think New York City has a um, history, a good history of bouncing back from uh, problems, uh, including epidemics. And uh, so I don't, I, you know, I think that things need to be rethought in terms of preparedness, but I don't think it um, is an argument to uh, go away from our city model. Dr. Padian? You know, I don't know what else I, I could add. I, I absolutely agree with uh, uh, Dr. Weissfuse, what was said. Uh, I, I will comment that, again, earlier on, uh, there was a lot of pundits who were saying that this is uh, an issue of urban environment. And we in public health were saying, that's what we're experiencing now from the viral dynamics, we knew that this, this virus was highly infectious and it was only a matter of time before it reached the heartland and the Midwest and, and, and you know, th that, ha that has played out. 
And so while, you know, uh, urban centers like New York bore the brunt of it earlier on, um, you know, New York is resilient, we learn, and, you know, we have to uh, adjust in terms of, especially in terms of preparing for the next one, and we will move on. I think the only thing that I would add to that is that we discussed earlier how New York City is a global hub and uh, probably had maybe had more introductions of the virus uh, <clears throat> than we knew and, and the virus was spreading rapidly uh, before any, any measures were taken. Whereas in other urban areas in the country, um, when the virus was introduced, th th there may have been more heightened awareness based on New York's ex early experience that uh, measures need to be taken and that's why we didn't see it quite to the degree that it happened in New York City. I, I, I don't know the data, but I think there are other urban areas similar to, to New York City, um, Chicago, you know, I, there are obviously some differences, but uh, I think I think that urbanicity is not the only is not the only factor. Well, so um, one urban area that had a very different experience was the urban area of Seoul, South Korea. Um, they, I mean, I've been looking to them because from, they, they seem sort of geographically positioned to be hit by the virus. They have a lot of uh, back and forth travel with China. Um, they have a very dense urban area. They have mass transit, they have dense housing. I'm sure there are differences, but they also had this they had this scare, I think it was with MERS. They had a, a previous scare and they decided in, in the wake of that, they decided, okay, we're gonna build, we're gonna, we're gonna be ready the next time. And they were ready the next time. And I guess the question is, can we do the same thing? Can we come out of this pandemic with uh, a system in place that will just run like a, a watch, you know, a Swiss watch the next time there's a threat like this, or or did South Korea just get lucky, or is there something about the South Korean um, society and government that you know that you know they can accept solutions that aren't going to work here? Do you do you have opinions on that? Any of you? Is that is it? I mean, should we? Is that something we should aspire to? To have, you know. Um, to have that kind of a, an experience the next time there's a, a virus. Well, I think we should try to aspire to that. I'm not sure that the solutions in the United States necessarily would be the same in South Korea. They may have uh, different ideas about, you know, uh, data and information on people than we do. Um, so you always have to adapt your public health preparedness and response to the, you know, the mores and the standards that the, you know, that are prevailing in any given uh, jurisdiction. Um, but I do think that we need to learn some really hard lessons here because, uh, you know, this was a kind of a predictable problem, but now that we've had it, uh, we really need to rethink our approach to uh, pandemic preparedness and use this as a launching point to uh, get the best possible, you know, preparedness system up and running. Anyone else? I, I'm not an expert on South Korea, but I think our our uh, federal structure here with the 50, 50 states and, and uh, traditional territories with their own sort of sovereign powers makes it much more difficult to have a unified approach and couple that with sort of the communication messaging level uh, disaster from the top uh, in the United States. I think Korea probably had much, you know, much more of a control over the messaging, a, a population perhaps more willing to, to uh, you know, follow orders, if you will, and, uh, you know, give up personal data through their phones, which is, which might not be as acceptable here. But certainly, we're, we're a, a very varied country, <clears throat> a much larger country with lots of, lots of different jurisdictions with different, different priorities. So it, it, it's much, much more of a challenge here to have a unified plan and present a unified front, uh, even under the best of circumstances. And we, we didn't have the best of circumstances with this, with this episode. 
So, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe the way I, maybe the better way to say this instead of bringing up South Korea is um, what would each of you, if, if, if the governor and the, and the legislative leaders came to you and said, we want to be prepared for the next pandemic, what would each, what would be your top, you know, one or two recommendations back to them? Why don't we start with Dr. Vidian? I'll just pick one, uh, which is uh, unity of message, meaning from top down, that again, there's a consistency in terms of, of, of information about the pathogen itself, information on what mitigation steps are effective, and that you know, individuals, uh, you know, compliance and adherence to those mitigation steps will be beneficial. And the, and consistency of message is the most important thing to me uh, uh, that I think uh, would have had a dramatic impact on, on the morbidity and mortality that we've seen. Dr. Weiss, please. To me, um, the most important thing is decision making and the role of uh, both politics and the scientists in uh, making decisions that help people. I think that uh, the decision making, at least locally, was uh, terribly flawed um, and not necessarily driven by uh, public health leaders. So, for example, if you had a big fire in Midtown, the mayor might be there to, you know, give some solace to people, etc. But the mayor's not going to put out the fire. The firemen are going to do that because they've been trained and they do that. That's what they do for a living. And I think similar here, I think there has to be uh, more recognition of you know, the, the important decisions that need to be made and what the role of both politicians and uh, public health or any experts in making those decisions. Dr. Birkin? I, I would agree that the most important things are the two things that have just been stated, the communications message and the, and the interplay of the political and the scientific. But I, I guess I would just add to that that we need to learn the lessons about the supply chain in the, in the, and, and fix the lab, the, the ability to rapidly scale up and do lab testing, the public health response through contact tracing. We need the data systems and, and other tools to make that able to turn on you know, very quickly. Um, and I guess I would add the, you know, in the, in the healthcare system itself, the, it, and these are not new concepts, but the ability to expand and surge uh, there uh, to have, we, we haven't talked about it, but to have a, a stockpile, uh, which was used in this case uh, and, and is never going to be able to fully meet a pandemic surge, but would be an interim step while the supply chains are turned on. So I think the supply chains for ventilators, PPE, lab testing supplies, other things need to be set up in advance uh, and pre preferably, you know, on a domestic level rather than relying on imports from other countries for that, for that sort of thing in, in the event of the next pandemic. Um, so I think th those are more nitty gritty kinds of lessons that we need to learn. Uh, and there's, there's a lot more that hopefully will happen during what we call after action kinds of efforts in, you know, looking back at what happened and what could have gone better. But I agree on the whole that the communications and the, and the, the scientific lead are, are two of the key issues that uh, we didn't do well on in this one. Well, one communications issue that came up that, that the whole world could see were um, incidents where the mayor would say one thing and the governor would say another. Um, and often they would be contradicting one another. Um, this is something that happens in all manner of political situations where city hall and the governor aren't on the same page. It seems to be just like a, a structural tension there. And it's not just about personalities. Has First of all, I guess I would ask, is there something like that between the two health departments? Do they, is there a natural tension between them? Is there like a natural jealousy? And is there a way to overcome that in a crisis like this? What, you know, should one or the other just be given 
top dog status and the other one defers or, or, or should they form a joint working group? I mean, is there, cause it's just really, I have to say it's really distressing as a member of the public to, to watch that happen in the heat of a crisis. It's almost as if the, the, you know, the building is burning down and you have the, the fire lieutenant in an argument with the fire chief instead of turning the hose on. Um, I just say in my in my experience, the state and city and the local health departments have always worked well, well together. We don't disagree on everything. We do, you know, hash issues out. But uh, I, I've never there's no there's no underlying tension there. It's it's uh, got to be a team effort. I think everybody appreciates that there are lines of authority laid out in public health laws. The locals have some independence, particularly New York City. Um, but at the at the department to department level, I think uh, you know relations are are good between the staff, and they and people work well together, know each other, and have worked with each other for a long time. Is that also your perception of it, Dr. Oasis? Yeah, and I think it's uh, even better during an emergency because I think people really will focus in on you know what needs to be done. Um, they're not you know sort of thinking about a thousand different things, and you know the urgency of of getting information and sharing information with the state is uh, really important. And I think that that has been uh, practiced. So I, I don't think that the, um, the issues that you're, you're raising are due to um, you know, city and state uh, dysfunction on communication. So maybe, maybe the answer, and, I, and I've seen this in other contexts, is that the elected leaders should step back and and that the, uh, the commissioners and the, the public health experts and epidemiologists should step forward and play more of a, a lead role. Um, I guess I, I can predict what your answers would be. To. Yeah. That's what I meant by the decision-making uh, issue. I mean, I think politicians are really important because they are the elected official of uh, whatever the jurisdiction is. Um, but let's not mistake that for um, you know, the, the education and experience in, in dealing with pub, a public health crisis. So I think there needs to be um, people around the table, but I don't think that choices or decisions should be made, uh, you know, mostly on political concerns. I think there has to be much, much more on the side of the public health and science with, um, you know, perhaps some political concerns shaping the message, but the decision, the, the actual decision of what to do I think has to be um, acknowledged to be, you know, in the hands of the experts. But the politicians are really critical in in understanding that and in communicating that. Um, so I think it's a good time to uh, take some questions from the audience, which I believe we have some. Um, I guess th this is a tough question because it does involve a certain amount of 2020 hindsight, but um, we've seen analyses that about the timing of the governor's um, lockdown order, what he called New York on pause. And there, I think there was even a study that said if it had been X days earlier, you might have saved X thousand lives. And that's, that's quite, a, quite a formula to put on somebody's head. But um, we've also discussed how there were people in the insides of the public health system who were screaming for action earlier. Um, do you have a, does anybody here have any solution for that? Like what, you know, what could be, is there a structural change or is it just the elected officials have to be, have a different kind of awareness of, of public health issues? I think you have to let, um, you know, uh, the, the, your, your duty to protect people's health and welfare be the, the absolute lead. And if it doesn't work out and the chips fall, you know, a different way, then so be it. But I think that that should be the primary concern I think that, uh, you know, that that has to be, you know, saving people's lives is really the number one, um, you know, duty, I think, of a federal or state or local government. And I think that it has to be recognized that 
that's the most important thing. There are, there are many other things that are really important, but um, you know, economic loss and closure of schools, you know, I think pale in comparison to losing lives. Oh, well, I guess, I guess I feel like I should speak up for the idea that there were, that there were, there were um, health and even life and death consequences of the shutdown itself. Right. I mean, there were deaths of despair. There were, you know, some, opioid uh, overdoses apparently increased there you know, um, other health issues are dis were, were uh, people weren't able to attend to because they weren't able to get around as easily um, I mean those are I mean those are things that the public health officials will be aware of but it's also they're, they're legitimate things to think about in this context aren't they yeah I think so but I do think that there was um perhaps some lack of preparation. All of these issues become really daunting if you're starting from scratch at the time of the need to make the decision. Uh, so for example, I think the issue of closure of schools in New York City is a really tough situation because of all the secondary consequences that may occur. But you know, had DOE you know, made some planning, it would perhaps it wouldn't have been such an overwhelming decision. In other words, if they had come to the table with some realistic plans of how to deal with school lunches and, and other things, um, you know, decision could have been made easier. And I suspect that uh, they were starting from scratch. That, I mean, that, so we talked earlier about pandemic planning. Uh, would that kind of planning process include representatives of schools and police departments and every other part of society? Dr. Vedian? Definitely, uh, you know, when we work, work, uh, you know, our kind of continuity of operations plan, uh, you know, our pandemic plan, you know, we bring in all stakeholders within the the the, the county in terms of developing something because again, it, it doesn't uh, the, the 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 issues don't rest with just the health department. The, the, you know, a pandemic has far-reaching impacts on society and community at large, and so. Of course, they have to have a voice. And I just add, I think I think there was an effort throughout the last decades of pandemic planning to engage other sectors, uh, uh, and particularly through the other at the state level, the other state agencies. I, I just I will comment: it's hard in the abstract to sit people down from different agencies and say, "What if uh, you know this was the scenario?" and and to really get get people to focus on that. Uh, so I, I think. Unfortunately, it took a real pandemic to do that, but I, I think we'll come we'll come out of it better if we if we now have the playbook a little bit clearer for all sectors about what their roles are. The health department certainly can't do it all themselves. Um, so I think the missed opportunity was partly on the federal level because CDC and HHS was really pushing pandemic planning in the mid two thousands, but their sister agencies in in different parts of federal government. We're not putting necessarily like the, the um, Department of Education, you know, on the federal level may not have been really had that as an issue and so therefore didn't attach any kind of conditions to uh, educational funding to come up with a plan. So I think there was discoordination on the federal level that exacerbated all these other issues for the people who are admittedly very, um, very busy. Um, but you really need the whole, the whole, if you're really gonna get behind it, you really need to get behind it. And I think the federal level sort of did not take advantage of that. So um, New, uh, it's pretty widely known that New York, if you look at its mortality rate adjusted for population, it's one of the highest in the country. Um, and so how, how should we, think about New York in comparison to other states. What, what does it say about New York that it has that status? Was it primarily because of its, uh, because of the fact that it was hit earlier relative to most other states? Was it something about the, the, the density and the other issues we talked about? Was it something about the, the, uh, the public health system or other parts of our society? Do, like, how, how concerned should New Yorkers be 
uh, at the at at how we compare with with other states. I mean, I think I think since the initial surge, which is where a lot of the mortality occurred, New York has actually has actually fared pretty well over the summer. Even in the mo most recent surge, we've other states have. Uh, Done, for, I think, far worse than, than New York has done. So it's really your question really gets back to sort of that what what happened in that initial surge. And I think it was uh, I, I don't know all the factors you mentioned, but uh, I think the early introduction and the in a time before there was a high level of urgency and before testing was widely available allowed it to spread uh, m much more rapidly. And and that uh, I, I mean since then I think we we've, we've uh, fared equally well or better than, than other states in this. I don't know what my colleagues think, but that's my sense. There, uh, another point that I've seen people make, and, I, and I've, I've seen some logic to their argument, is that in a moment like New York had in late March, dramatic non-pharmaceutical interventions, you know, lockdowns is the other term that gets thrown around, that that was effective, but when you talk about a period of months uh, in the context of much lower rates of infection and, and um, you know, the, the, the pandemic is in kind of a low boil, um, does it make, do our lockdowns as effective in that context? And by lockdowns, I guess I mean the restrictions on business that are pretty severe in some cases, um, and the limits on travel and the lim uh, not being able to visit people in nursing homes. Does should those things be rethought when they're going to be lasting for months instead of weeks? I mean, that is that is an argument people make. I'm not sure I find it convincing, but. But people have said these, they have a particular objection to long-term lockdowns. They see the wisdom of a short-term lockdown. Is there, a, is there a diminishing return that you get from that, Dr. Vaidian? I think it's important that, again, there is nuance to this because, again, I think earlier on, uh, a more widespread lockdown was dictated by, by what the data was showing. Uh, but once that lockdown had some impact and our rates were, were dropping. I was, uh, I, I was amenable to, to sort of more focus interaction, excuse me, intervention on particular areas of the state that needed it, depending on what the data showed. And so I, I think lockdowns are effective uh, in, but again, once you see uh, the, the, the type of impact that you're seeing, I think you could move to a more nuanced approach. That's my opinion anyway. Any last words? We're, we're pretty much at the end of our two hours. Uh, any, any points that you think we, we should have made that we haven't gotten to? Well, uh, if that's the case, I'd like to thank all of you, this has uh, it's been very uh, interesting to me, uh, very informative, uh, and I hope useful. I hope this um, we're going to be uh, bringing this to the attention of elected officials if they haven't already paid attention. Um, so thank you very much. It's been a, a great event, and I very much appreciate your your willingness to participate. Um, and to people in the audience, thank you for listening. Um, I'm, a, I'm sorry that I can't see you and, and, and uh, appreciate whether you're laughing or crying at this point. Um, but uh, that's our event for today and uh, take care all of you. Thank you. Thank you.